Right, good morning everyone. Um, I'd just like to first of all just introduce myself and just give a brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I suppose it's a bit more like a case study. Um, I'm a parent of um, somebody with beds and basically why am I here, who's it for? This is my son, this is Hugo. He, this is a current photograph of him, age five, but he was actually diagnosed at the age of two, which is very young um, to be diagnosed, we've been told quite often. Um, but I'm hoping that this might be something that isn't going to be uncommon in the future, that perhaps with more awareness, these sorts of things can be picked up earlier um, and it won't be such an uncommon thing. I'm going to be discussing from the point of view of some mum, what it's like to have a child that has beds, and it might even resonate with some of you out there who have young families or um, are parents that have uh, grown-up children here and think, yeah, this, this was similar, this is what we went through. Or also that you might have family members who you haven't made the connection with and they're going through similar things and think this might, be, this might resonate with them as well. So it's all really to do with raising awareness and just trying to get it out there so that people are more aware of feds. Um, so, first of all, how did we encounter VEDS? How did we uh, find out about it? This is um, a family picture of the four of us. Uh, nothing unremarkable here, you know, with just no, no phenotypes in us as parents. Um, and my other son actually doesn't have it at all. The other lady in the photograph wearing the yellow um, T-shirt, I'm going to talk a little bit more about her in a moment because she's quite instrumental in how we got our diagnosis as well. So. Um, how did Hugo come into the world? Well, I think how my pregnancy developed at the very end is quite significant. I had premature ruptured membranes at 35 weeks, uh, a totally normal pregnancy, quite a small bump. It was remarked quite often that I was very small and neat, um, but absolutely fine. Um, due to one reason or another, he was finally delivered at uh, 36 weeks by C-section, weighing five pounds two ounces, so quite a low birth weight. Again, no distress, um, induction failed to happen, um, he wasn't distressed, but it was because of the length of time since my waters had gone that they decided to um, deliver him. And it was quite obvious though that he just wasn't ready to be born, he had a lot of growing left in him. and. If I just put this picture on here, you can see that this is after about five to six weeks, got the saggy skin, the big eyes, um, it just didn't really appear with it. He just, he just wasn't ready to be born. And I think in hindsight, what I was since read is that the premature rupture of membranes in VEDS um, uh, people is, is quite common because the membranes that surround the baby, the amniotic sac, are actually the babies, not the mothers. So when they ruptured, when my membranes ruptured, they were actually his. So they ruptured just presumably because there's just a weak point. So he, he really wasn't ready to be born, but it just it happened because, as we know, with collagen, it's faulty, and therefore it's, the membranes weren't held together very well. Um, in hindsight, because he came early, it probably did save his life. Um, he was put in special care. Um, because he had to have um, intravenous antibiotics, so it meant he had to be go, go down there and be looked after. I would go down to feed him, or sometimes he'd come up to me, I'd change him and do all those sorts of things. And it was whilst, once he was being fed, um, that I started to notice he seemed quite distressed, and his abdomen looked like it was swelling and descending. And I noticed this on several occasions, mentioned it to the nurses and said, you know, my son seems quite distressed after feeding. He's not necessarily keeping all his food down. I know that might be expected in the newborn, but it, there's something not quite right here. And his crying is a distress. It's not a baby that's just a newborn, weenie baby. And I was basically told, you're a new mum, babies cry, and you'll just have to get used to it. <laughs> but I knew something in, in me, and I've heard this again in the talks, today and yesterday, this intuition, something inside, I just knew something wasn't right, something was wrong. And I kept badgering them and, and everything else. And finally, it was an, another time that he was down on special care. One of the nurses, the specialist nurses, heard the crying that I was talking about, and there it just completely changed everything. 
Um, they, uh, he was overnight, he was moved, something happened during the night and he was moved into a different bed. When I went down on the ward the following morning, he had about 15 doctors and medics around him and were just discuss it, trying to cannulate him and do all sorts of things. And they'd noticed that his stomach had quite um, hugely um, descended during the night. And whilst I was down there, I said, well, what's going on? What, what should... It, it, oh, the doctor will come and chat to you in a minute. If you go back upstairs, we'll come up to you, blah, blah, blah. And I, as I walked out of the room, I heard them on the phone to Great Ormond Street asking for an intensive care bed. And I just thought, please don't be my son. But obviously it turned out that it was. And once they'd made that call, the rest is history. It, within moments, they were calling. They got a bed organised. Um, they had to blue light him down to Great Ormond Street with his ruptured bowel and he was operated on that afternoon. So this was a week after he was born, um, he was being operated on for a ruptured bowel. So very, very early on, we um, had a medical complication with Hugo. Um, the rupture required ileostomy. Um, obviously, we didn't know at this stage it was beds, so these are all leading up to this, how we got our diagnosis. Um, he had an ileostomy so that he could rest his gut for six months. And during that time, we would have weekly trips to Great Ormond Street to go over his uh, surgery, make sure he was healing okay. And it was during these times that I used to say, look, I just don't understand why this happened. Yes, he was premature, because he was 36 weeks, but that's not hugely premature. Um, why, why does this happen? And they tested for two things. They tested for Hirschsprung's disease, which... Um, is to do with the nerve endings of the gut and helping peristalsis and moving um, uh, waste through the system. And they suspected that maybe he had that and that, um, uh, that that's why his gal, uh, bowel ruptured. When they ruled that out, they checked something else, which was necrotizing enterocolitis, um, which is inflammation of the guts and can cause blockages and then and the, the tissue dies, basically. And it wasn't that either. And thereafter, they, there was no more investigation. And I kept asking, but why does this happen? Why, you know, it doesn't seem right to me. And being a science background and a questioning background, I just thought it just doesn't sit right. And I'd noticed other things as well, like the veins that were spreading across his um, abdomen quite noticeably. And I said, is, is that normal? Is that because of surgery? Did something happen? Um, and then other things, like he, he had large sutures in his head, so not just the fontanelle, which was huge anyway, but the sutures that hadn't healed in his skull yet. And this, we're talking, you know, six, eight, maybe two, three months on, actually. And they were about the width, almost, of my little finger. Um, bleeding from his stoma site, just regular, kept, kept bleeding. Um, the transparent, loose skin, the sagging skin. And all of these things, I said, is this just down to a premature baby? And... The surgeon who did the work, a very eminent professor, but a um, man of very few, few words just sort of said, these things happen. And I, but it just, just didn't rest with me. I was eventually told to just let him carry on, uh, enjoy him. He's got through his surgery. He's OK. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy, enjoy being in, with him. He is going to be a bit delayed. Um, because of what he's had done and you know, major gut surgery and also I was told that children that spend a certain amount of time in hospital early on can put them back about six months anyway so I thought fine I'll go with it and, and just see what happens um, but in the meantime um, I had a friend a few doors down who would come my friend that was in the picture before and she would come up and see me and just see how Hugo was doing and she would Quite often, I talked to her about the, the bruising he was now starting to get as he was more mobile. And, and bruising, and he wasn't a particularly mobile child, but I'm talking about bruising if he just moved his leg or I picked him up or his leg um, when he was on the floor might just roll against the sofa, something like that. Um, and she also picked up on how hypermobile he was, which I actually played down and said, well, he's a baby. They've, they've got loads of collagen. So, you know, at this point, you know, and cartilage in their bones. And I just thought, there's nothing wrong. And I realised she had seen something, um, and I, I just say what she does, she's actually a lecturer herself in physical support at the London Contemporary Dance School, so she'd come across uh, all sorts of conditions like this, and she'd actually written a paper on hypermobility, and I've since found out actually she'd, in doing that research, she'd come across Ella Zanlos because she suspected a couple of her patients might have had it, her, her students had it. So, 
she was sort of giving me bits of information. I realise now she was probably drip feeding me little bits for me to try and take on board. Aware that I just had to deal with a major issue with my son and his surgery and knew I probably didn't want to have to cope with much else, but she's just, just feeding it along. And I don't know, I think there was a significant time where we'd, we'd gone out walking with my son and he'd been in a baby carrier on my husband's back. And when we took him out, his shins were just purple from the top of his knees to his ankle bones on both legs. He hadn't been in pain, it was just where it had been rubbing on the back of his, his back, uh, on my husband's back, the way he'd been walking. And I pointed that out to my friend, and that's when she's like, right, I really think you need to have a look at something. And she told me about the Ellis Danlos um, Society and also look it up online, which I did. And I just think, again, like I feel a lot of people in this room have said, you read something about it. I clicked on it, read the different things, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is my son. This, you know, all these symptoms, this is him. And one thing my friend did say, she said, there's different forms of it, and they're she said, there is one that's not very nice, but I don't in any way think that's the one your son has got. Well, obviously, when I went online and I looked at everything, the vascular type was the one I assumed that he had. I think from that point on, we were very lucky because um, I was now pregnant with my second son, and it came up at one of my um, uh, obstetrician appointments. And she said, apart from the uh, premature delivery of your son, was there anything else that we should be aware of? And I said, well, we have noticed hypermobility. His paediatrician has looked into that and he's now being referred down to a physio working on that. However, that's led to me reading a little bit more and a, and a lecturer friend of mine suggesting Ellis Danlos. Now, I think at this point, had she not really heard much, it could have been poo-pooed. But because she said, I have heard of it and I do know there is one type that's really bad and your friend's absolutely right, you should get it checked. And if it is at the bad type, I know you can do it with a, a blood test, a DNA test. And, but the problem was, it was referring, I was under her care, she couldn't refer him, so we had to go back to my GP, but actually went through my paediatrician, who is fantastic, at my local hospital in Barnet, and she admitted, I don't know much about it, we cover it in medical school, however, I'm very good at coordinating things, and within three days, she set up the appointment at Northwick Park Hospital where we went to get um, him diagnosed. And <clears throat> I think from the moment we walked into the room there, I think the genetic counsellors and the consultant that was in there, it was almost like they'd, they'd just seen it based on his <coughs> facial characteristics, the, the phenotype of him, and the way we'd been presenting. I do remember them saying that had he probably just presented with hypermobility and bruising, his case wouldn't have been necessarily so significant. It was the fact he'd had that ruptured bowel in that first week of birth so early on that drew their attention to him. And then, like I said, they saw his facial characteristics and, and the other bits, the, the veins on his abdomen. And I think they knew straight away that's what they were looking at. But obviously we had the DNA test done. Um, they took our bloods as well. Um, but actually they uh, tested him first and unfortunately um, 24th of December 2013 we got the news that it was in fact beds and then they tested our blood that they had um, there <coughs> but we're not carriers. Um, at that point I couldn't do anything about my other son I was pregnant with. Um, I only had about eight weeks to go. It was, amniocentesis was too late so what they actually did is when he was born was to take his cord blood and test that, and he's also unaffected. So Hugo is um, the a de novo mutation, it started with him. And I think, you know, once we got that diagnosis, it was a little bit of relief in some ways that all these questions I'd had, I wasn't going mad. There is actually something wrong with him. So therefore, I, you know, I've got proof here and, and I can do something, I can work with that and do something about it. But I also thought, my goodness, overnight, my son who put to bed, no worries at all, suddenly I thought, I can't leave him. If he falls out of his bed, it could kill him. So for the next, I think, probably two or three months, he was sleeping in our bed with us because I was just, what do you do when you're told you have beds and you've read all everything you know about it and you've got a, a little baby who you've got to protect? So I just think overnight, I thought, something untoward's going to happen, but obviously it didn't. Um, 
But basically, going from getting the diagnosis and thinking, yes, a little bit of relief here, at least I've got something I can give to medics now to say, um, this is what's wrong with him, now we can work from here. But in hindsight, it's a bit naive, I suppose, because just because I've got this information here doesn't actually mean that doctors understand. In fact, we're finding the complete opposite. We're having to educate them most of the time on the research that we've done ourselves. And in reality, no one really understands it as well as yourself, and you become your own advocate, or in this instance with Hugo, um, by proxy for him. Um, and you literally have to tell um, hospitals, ER staff, what exactly is going on with him and push to sort of sometimes have things done. Um, once we got diagnosed, um, we were put in touch with um, the Ellis Analog Society and also um, contact with Jared and Sarah Griffin through Annabelle's Challenge. And I remember speaking with Sarah on numerous occasions because Annabelle was only a couple of years older uh, than Hugo at that time. And I just, where do you start with a with how to deal with it with a young child. There's a lot of information about beds in older people, but not in, in younger people, certainly under the age of about 10, because it's just not being recorded yet, really, because it's just not being diagnosed. But statistically, there has to be other children out there with it. It's just not being diagnosed. Um, straight away, Sarah was really helpful in telling me, do you know who you need to go and see? Um, Northwick Park already organised cardiac appointments for Hugo, so we knew we had to go and get his heart checked out. And obviously, again, based on the talk yesterday, we can see how important that is to, to follow up all those appointments, um, which he has um, uh, six monthly. Um, we were told we'd need a rheumatologist, an ophthalmologist, a gastroenterologist, um, because there is no one VEDS consultant, and there is no handbook that tells you what to do. So you have to sort of initiate um, seeing these, these particular medics, but I, again, I'm very lucky that I've got a coordinating paediatrician in Barnet who's very good at helping us do that. But you still have to go out there and ask to see, and ask to see it. Um, other information that we've got, I've got from looking in books, uh, medical papers online, reading up on research um, and things like that, Facebook sites, social media. But again, I would say to those people that are new to it or, or finding out about it, to be very careful what you read because in some ways we were reading a lot of stuff that was quite, um, it's scary, it, it happens, but you know we wanted to almost know the worst case scenario so that we could deal with that and think, right, we, that's where we can start from. But I would say when you do look at stuff online, just bear in mind that every child, I believe, is different. It's a bit like having um, diabetes. Not everyone suffers with it the same way. And how your child will have beds, or yourself might have beds, might be very different to somebody else, how uh, the symptoms that you, you have. And just going into now looking at how we can get help and, and how we deal with Hugo's injuries and, um, and coping with things like that. I think now that we've had to live with it for a few years, we've, we've found things that work for us. And I think it's mostly a damage limitation exercise. He is going to fall over, he is going to have bumps and scratches and all sorts of things. It's about minimising the risk and it's about stopping it becoming a major complication that he ends up at hospital uh, having surgery done. And you do end up not just thinking a couple of steps ahead, it's a hundred steps ahead. But that is quite hard to impart to caregivers or teachers. You know, as a mum, you're used to every step, you know, thinking ahead. It's imparting that to teach them and saying, you have to do that when I'm not there. And that can be the hard, the hard thing, especially when you've got a child that outwardly doesn't look like he's got anything wrong with him at all. Um, certainly with Hugo, we notice that, um, again, the, the bruising is significant. He's, this is just one picture that I've got here with bruises on his head there. Um, Another well, incident of where he fell over and lacerated his knee, which unfortunately does seem to be the biggest issue with him, is knee. He's not really got much skin left there. We've been told to try and sew back together. Um, but it's, it's minimising those sorts of falls. Um, Hugo bru uh, bruises very easily. He gets the hematomas where it, it, it sort of clots under his skin, where the vessel's broken. He fatigues, he's hugely tired all the time. I still have to nap him at weekends. Uh, he has to have a snooze. 
If he doesn't, he becomes so clumsy and his spatial awareness kind of goes out the window. He's more likely to fall over or onto something and then that's when I worry about him rupturing something or uh, badly lacerating his skin. Um, Something that's worked really well with us, because his knees are a problem, are knee pads. And I was going to bring some here today, but he's wearing them, so I couldn't. <laughs> um, and they were something we found ourselves. I remember going to the OTs and saying, is there something you can recommend that we can almost put over his skin to stop him from damaging himself so much? No, you can get orthotics, you can get all sorts of other things to help, but nothing to actually help with, with the skin. And I just found these ones, went online, and they're like a almost like a stretchy sock you pull on but with a spongy bit um, in the middle that goes over his knee and you can also wear them on your <coughs> elbows as well and they're not hard like the ones you have perhaps if you're doing skateboarding or something so this is something that you can wear all the time like a sort of mini leg warmer you pull on and they've been invaluable for the two years he's been wearing those we've had no more emergency trips uh, to deal with laceration of knees and again if anyone's interested I can tell you a little bit more about where I've found those online where to get them from um, up till then we were dealing mostly with knee problems until last summer he fell over and knocked his four front teeth out, split his lip and um, required surgery to basically stitch it all back together. This also highlighted a trauma plan that had been put in place that he's meant to go to the Royal Free where they have a specialist plastics team, didn't work because they didn't want to operate on him, mainly because they didn't think it was necessary and that that would heal on its own. And we had to say, no, as a VEDS patient, it won't heal on its own. It needs pulling together. And the quicker you do that, the quicker, the better the outcome. And after three days, backwards and forwards, of them eventually not agreeing to do it, Barnet came up trumps and they did it for us. So a non-specialist hospital plastics team did it for us and they were fantastic. And it just keeps showing, keep Keep in dialogue with your physician, your, like our paediatrician managed it perfectly for us. Um, d question things. Um, I wasn't going to walk away from a hospital with him looking like, or being left like that. And I basically had the top plastic surgeon telling me it didn't need to be done. And I got my, then had to get on the phone to my paediatrician and say, she doesn't want me to have it done. I'm basically being told that I'm almost a bad mum if I let her go through with it. She said, Victoria, I've seen your son. We've seen him here at Barnet. We know it needs stitching. In this instance, you go with your gut and you do the right thing, which is what we did. And he basically had it all stitched up, which is perfect now. But I think this, as an advocate for VEDS, you need to question, you need to be strong, follow your instincts, use it to educate other um, uh, doctors. Um, looking to the future, how can we help with VEDS? Well, spreading awareness, documenting everything, so things like this, I type up notes, I give to his school, um, keep details of all his falls, his operations, the doctors we've come into contact with, he has a medical alert, alert card, and keep talking about it to parents, friends, um, his school are fantastic, his friends are fantastic with it, and their parents also now talk to me about it. Um, looking to the future, I know that he's not going to be able to do everything, but the school are managing it in a way that he does as much to join in as possible and he's happy and he's having a great time at school and at the moment that's all really that I want him to be able to do that it's positive and he's happy and he's enjoying his life and looking forward to the future. Okay, thank you.